Ashe family, welcome back to another episode of My Unapologetic Perspective. This is the podcast where we give our point of view on controversial topics from my experience, black history, and our knowledge as African Americans. Black history presently lives in us as we can continue to excel into the future. It's one thing to know black history, it's another thing to take advantage of what the people in black history did for you. I am your host, Marjorie Baker Stevens, and to the right of me is Shaquan Battle. Here. And to the right of him is Jerome Battle. What's up? Uh, we appreciate all the love and support we've been getting. Uh, couldn't mean anybody, couldn't mean more to anybody than us. Um, thanks to all the people who've been tuning in through uh, all of the uh, year and a half, two years we've been doing this. Um, it's much appreciated. I can't express that enough. Um, where would you guys like to begin? Uh, start by giving a, a shout out to <clears throat> a local black owned business, um, Bridge Street Cafe, owned by Justin Hayden, okay. two year anniversary. Uh, so congr- congratulations to him on all the success that he's been having. Um, super proud of him. Um, you know, the relationship me and him have. I know this been in the works for him for 10 plus years. Didn't know it was going to be a coffee shop, but he knew it was going to be something. And, I mean, as patient as that dude is and meticulous as this dude is, and to see him actually go do it is is phenomenal. Um, I don't even know the history of where that's located. I mean, we he might own something that black people was not even able to go into at one point. Um, so it's – he owns something that he's able that he's gonna be able to hand down to, you know, generations after generations. So salute, bro. Yeah, that's fire. That's fire. Um, I'll, I'll let you go. I'll let you set it wherever you, <laughs> you want to set it. Man. Set it um, off. You like poor Zingas? We give you the first, the first fourteen <laughs> points, the first <laughs> one. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with um. The black, the black hockey player. You guys may have heard the black hockey player in a fatal freak accident where his skate um, cut the throat of a white hockey player who had fell on the ice, cut his throat and killed him, bled to death. I don't know if you guys heard the story. About I that. didn't. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely a tragic accident. And I'm emphasize the word accident. Because there are a lot of white people who feels like it was not an accident and that he actually murdered a white person. And when I first heard the story about the accident, that's exactly how I viewed it, as an accident. And then later on that day, I started seeing different reports that where white people were saying that he, he murdered and some of the, I'm going to read one of the comments because um, I found a comment. The, the, the fact that what it said, though. people could even imagine <coughs> that this was somehow a intent situation blows my mind. But I'm going to read this comment. Matt Peck, Petgrave, this is a black guy is the low impulse con- compulse control nigga who murdered Adam Johnson in a violent racial hate crime. Petgrave angled his skate blade upwards and intentionally hit Johnson in the neck. Petgrave has, exact, has the exact same blank stare as a career violent criminal and drug addict, George Floyd. I, I, I'm going to read one more. Another racist wrote, we all know the mainstream media will do everything to make lots of lies to protect black people, especially when it involves killing white people. But this Zoom clip clearly shows Matt Pegray murdered Adam Johnson. You won't see him losing his balance, rather see him intentionally go for the kill, which is not true. If you if you watch the clip, and of course it's graphic, if you can now see it, because most cases they deleted it, but obviously it was an accident. Um, but the fact that, and I made this statement before several times the last couple of weeks that we did the podcast about 
why do white people hate black people so much? Um, after our last episode, I had a white guy ask me, he was like, well, what is it that black people want? And <laughs> I'm, I'm going to quote something that I heard one of Bates' favorite, James Baldwin, say. He said, white people will ask, what do we want? The thing is, is you may not know what we want per se. But what you do know is that there's not one single white American who would want to be black in America. So that says enough about <clears throat> what we want. Right. Because obviously you wouldn't want to be black in America. So that tells you that there's a lot of things that's being done to black people for simply being black. And that's the case probably with every white American is that they know that blacks are treated unfairly, unjustly, unequally mm -hmm. in America. Most of them just want to, don't want to admit that they too view black people differently. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about every white person, of course. But again, even in this country right now today, white people are still the majority. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those folks are racist. are racist. Even if it's not intent mm -hmm. racism. Because race racism without intent is still racism. Right. right? So even if you don't know that you're racist, well, the things that you say or do are racist does not mean you're not racist. You're still racist. And we see it every day. Um, and to me, this was especially racist because it's clearly an accident. Clearly an accident. Again, nowhere in history, recent or past history, have black people united and said, let's go kill white folks. Never. That's not what we do. That's what you do, but that's not what we do. And in this case, there's nowhere in the world this black hockey player intentionally killed this white guy. Yeah, that it, it goes back to something that you know we said a long time ago is that what we're doing is trying to combat racism, but when you try to counter the combat of racism to say black people are racist against white people, that's not true. When you talk about the things that we talk about that happen in this country, that continues to happen in this country, it's us pointing out racism. Now white people are starting to say that they're the victims of racism for black people pointing out racism. That's right. In this situation, then I've seen the video too. You can't prove intent when it comes to that. Because we've right. seen things all throughout sports that say, hey, leading with the crown of the helmet. Mm -hmm. Or uh, in basketball, um, kicking up your leg and hitting somebody in the nuts. Like That's all right. this stuff is not natural motions, but we see it all the time. And we That's see right. it. And we can't justify whether it's intentional or unintentional. But when you talk about somebody dying in a, in a sport, you're not going to be able to prove intent. I don't care what the person's history is. That's right. When we see boxing matches where people have died in boxing matches from, from different type of punches, nobody knew that that would happen. That's you can't right. prove intent. You can't prove intent when it comes to certain situations like that. And the reason why this is brought to the light to say that this person should be um, charged and, and prosecuted for this is because it's black on white. Mm -hmm. If this was black on black, it would not be. If it was white on white, it would not be. I wouldn't even go to the, the further extent to say if a white player did this to a black player. We, it would be outraged, but I don't think nobody would say that this was intentional. No. Not, not in that aspect. Um, that... that that is the the, the, the the things that we live in and the things that we have to deal with when dealing with racism is you got these people who want to ignore racism so much that they want to put themselves in the middle of it to say, hey, we're being targeted now because black people feel a certain type right. of way. You, you see how quick they was to devalue the, 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 the black guy in yeah. this situation? 
and and was quick to compare him to someone else that they devalued in George Floyd. Right. Um, that making that connection is how they devalue black 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 Americans. You know, I, I'm I'm a segue to that um, because it's something that I had, but I believe that um, phrase goes along to what I what I have down, and, I, and I'll explain why before I even get into the topic, which is a friend of mine sent a. Um, video to me. It was Candace on this <coughs> talking um, and he was like, uh, tell me what you agree with and what you don't agree with about what she said. It was like a five minute video. And one of the things that I disagree with what she said was in the beginning. And she said that her grandfather was behind her and he taught her not to be a victim. Right? And in a world where black people want to be looked at as the victim. And I said, that's incorrect. I said, you're not going to find any black person that ever that that's worth anything that tells you that their parents or their grandparents taught them to be a victim. Nobody said that. Did we teach our kids? We were taught that, Hey, you have to work twice as hard as other people based on this situation. That's right. For example, we've talked about when you go early to school, right? That you're not going to be treated like the white kids are treated. We're not just saying that just because it's a, a race thing. There's statistics to back it up. Okay. That black people get suspended or expelled from school more times than white people for the same thing. So we already know that the statistics are against us. And once they get older, they start driving. You say, hey, be careful out on the road because you're more likely to be stopped and searched. That's right. We've talked about this on this podcast. Not, not just to say it, just to be saying it. Statistically shows that at a um, disproportionate rate, this happens. That's right. Right? So, moving forward with that, it's not the fact that we want to be victims. Right. It is the fact that we have to have these conversations with our kids that nobody else has to have with their kids. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because we've been victimized <clears throat> in the past, and statistics show that we are the victims of things that happen at a disproportionate rate. Not to say that we like it or we agree with it. That's right. It happens. It happens. Right? And the point that I'm trying to get to is we're not looked at as a victim. And let me clarify. Due to the history, we've been victimized. But currently, you can read comments now that says black people want to be a victim. You weren't not in slavery, so you're not a victim. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. So when you get into situations where you are a victim, black people can't be victims. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right? So in that situation, a black person can't be a victim because society has created the narrative that black people, only thing they want to do is look like a victim. So we can't be victims. And the, the, the topic that I have is when it comes to black women getting a protective order. Mm -hmm. And I'm only bringing this up because there's a uh, person that I'm friends with on social media who just went through this. I'm not going to get into her case, but it, it's an important conversation to have because a lot of men know women that's been abused mm -hmm. in some type of way, right? And minorities are significantly less likely to get a protective order when they go to court. That's right. Even though they're abused more than any other ethnic group, African-American women are least likely to get a protective order. So the reason being is because when you go to court and try to get a protective order, you have to look like a victim. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, black people aren't looked at like a victim in court. That's right. Even then when you are a victim, we've seen people who have been killed, beaten, abused, and then when they get on TV, it's making the other person look mm -hmm. like a victim. The key point is Trayvon Martin and um, George Zimmerman. That's, right. That's one of the key cases I can think of right off the top of my head, is that they are looked at as not being a victim. Black women, 22% 20, of black women have admitted to being raped. <clears throat> and that's just them admitting to it. Admitting to it, yeah. Black women are killed at a higher rate more than any other female ethnic group. When abuse occurs, they are least likely to be believed and supported in their case. That's right. Little black girls, they've done a study on this. Little black girls are often looked at as not being victims because they're seen as adults and not children more than white people. That is something that they have to deal with on a regular basis. So when you talk about the mentality that we can't have 
a victim attitude that treats these women to say people will not believe me. So they will not report certain things that happen because they already know ain't nobody going to believe my story. So you have cases like uh, Wendy Black, who was pregnant, and she went and filed three protective orders against her ex-husband. And in the protective order, it said that I'm going to kill, I got a gun and I'm coming to get you. Three separate instances, all three protective orders denied. She was later killed and the ex-husband killed himself after he killed her. A Michigan woman was denied a protective order against, um, against her husband. And then two weeks later, he shot and, shot and killed her and the children. We've seen cases like Tenaldo Hall, who was a 20-year-old mother that was being abused by her boyfriend, and then the boyfriend abused her two children. And when they went to court, she got sentenced to 30 years for failing to protect her children because she didn't do nothing about the abuse, even though evidence shows she was not present for the abuse of the children and she was being abused herself. Her abuser got two years in prison. Sintonia Brown, we all know this story, a 16-year-old girl who spent 15 of her 50 years behind bars for killing her abuser. It's because black people cannot be looked at as victims. That's right. Because society has showed us that we've been victimized in the past, and if we say the word victim, they're going to say that you're making an excuse for somebody to feel sorry for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, not in direct correlation with what you just said. I, I'm a fan of Dr. Jawanze um, Kunjufu. Um, I, I read a lot of his writings and his Who that? lectures. It's a he's a Afri he's a he's an African American doctor. He actually um, migrated from Africa a, a few years after you know being 15, 16 years old. And um, he's actually the originator of what's called the fourth grade failure syndrome which refers to biases in school that directly correlate with cultural insensitivity, disproportionate, harsh discipline for black students, um, lowered expectations for teachers um, in, in predominantly black schools, and tracking black students into special education and remedial uh, classrooms, which we've talked about in this podcast many times before. Because a lot of times when you have a black child who may have behavioral issues, they're quick to put him in one of the remedial classes, saying that he may have some type of learning disability when in fact his situation may be have nothing to do with the ability to learn. Right. It may be behavioral because of can living conditions. Mm -hmm. Um things that school systems do not investigate. What they do is they simply say this child falls in this category mm -hmm. and put them in remedial classes. I've actually seen that when I was in, in, in high school where a couple of my friends had behavioral issues, um, ended up in remedial classes, but were very smart, went on to, to go to college and, and, and do great things. So we've seen that happen a lot. But there's one important thing that, that Dr. Jawanze always talks about that I, I've actually said on this podcast many times before is education can can be somewhat of an equalizer in terms of playing fields to to for black people to be accepted uh, in a different manner or viewed in a different manner but I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something because there is so uh, something else that I talk about on this podcast a lot that I think that black people do not do enough of which is there has to be some self-accepted responsibility and when I say that, I mean, as black people, we have to be, do, as Baker said, we have to be better than our counterparts in every situation. And a lot of times we look at that from a from a work standpoint. I know in your job, you want to be better than the average white officer on your job. You have to be in order to continue to have your job on your job. And what you do, you have to be better than all the white people that do your job because you're less likely to get the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. if you don't, right? Right. Well, <clears throat> that also applies in everything that we do before we get to the employment stage in our lives. Uh, and, and, and this is something that I heard a long time ago, but it still applies today. Now, the numbers are going to be a lot different, but the percentages are probably going to be about the same. Let me give you an example. 
So last year, there were a million black boys that wanted to play in the NBA. Of that million, only 400,000 would even go on to play high school football, uh, basketball. Of that 400,000, only 4,000 would be able to play college ball. Of that 4,000, only 35, not 35,000, 35, not 3,500, 35 will make it to the NBA. Of that 35, only seven will start for an NBA team. The average life of an NBA player is four years. Mm -hmm. So the real problem is this. You have a million brothers looking for seven full-time jobs that would only last for four years. Mm -hmm. Yet last year, we had 100,000 jobs available to be computer programmers, engineers, and doctors. But only 1,000 brothers qualify. So our appeal to black males should be that you realize the odds. That that you do most is that what you do best. We are the first doctors, not Hippocrates, but Emotet. We have the ability to do math and science or play music or play sports. That that you do most will be that you do best. Mm -hmm. If you play basketball from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, you can be a very good basketball player. If you come home and go to the library, you'll be a very good scholar. You do What you do the most of is what you can be the best at. We need more black role models encouraging our youth in math and science. Mm -hmm. Just education in general, not necessarily just sports or music. When you look at commercials that you see black people in, most of the time we're either singing or it's sports related, mm -hmm. right? Very rarely <coughs> do you see us in the role of being good mothers or fathers or doctors or anything like that. Very rarely do you see commercials that portray us in that manner. When I think about the Cosby show, the comedy side wasn't the first thing that stood out. Mm -hmm. The first thing that stood out is that you had... As parents, you had a doctor and a lawyer mm -hmm. as parents. Right. That's what stood out about the Cosby show. There was times where you wanted Theo to come home and have a real urban crisis right. that you never really saw other than maybe somebody finding some weed or, as they call it, pop mm -hmm. in his book bag or something like that. There was no real urban situations. That was something different, and we talk about imagery all the time. That was the intent. We had good times to show us what it looked like in the ghetto, right? We had the Jeffersons to show us what it looks like when you're trying to move up. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Cosby show that shows you when you finally have an opportunity to do something different than what, you, what was portrayed to you early in your life. Mm -hmm. So as black people, we have to do more to confront the odds, the odds for the, the kids. To, and I realize in black, in black households, we use sports to help us as a tool to have your kids do well in school. Right. Right. So you're not going to play basketball if you don't do well in school. Mm -hmm. We use it as a tool. And when, I'm not knocking parents to do that. But what I'm saying is, is you also have to make sure that they're doing school, taking on school in the sense that they want to learn something. And I'm not making this up. I cannot tell you how many people I know that graduated with me that can't spell graduation. Mm -hmm. So just graduating is enough. What did you learn? My dad used to tell me every day I came home from school, he said, tell me what you learned. Tell me one thing that you learned today. <laughs> it is important that you learn something. Even though there is no true equalizer, education can be used as an equalizer. The more you know, the better you can do. But also, the more you do is what you're going to be the best at. So if you play basketball for eight hours a day and you study for two hours a day, you're going to be a better basketball player than you are anything else. Yeah. You have to, as black parents, we have to teach our kids to do better in math and science, English, history, not just sports and music. I think, I think also that's why we need, we need more black teachers. Um, big, you know, on the wire, when they was, it was an episode where they was in school and the kid was struggling in math. And, and I, and I know <coughs> teachers are going to say they don't have time to do this because they have 14, 15 other kids that they have to worry about. I understand that. But the guy, the teacher broke it down to the kid in drug and in, in selling drugs 
terminology. Mm -hmm. Same thing on Sunset Park when Dre was helping, uh, what was my man's name? When he was helping him with his homework oh, and he oh. could, yeah, he was helping Butter with his homework. Butter liked girls. He liked taking girls out on the date. So Dre broke it down to him and dating a girl. You take her out, you buy two chickens, how much money you got left over. And then Butter got it. That's right. Um, same thing with the behavior issue. Um, I know when we was mentoring, we had one kid that simply said, look, when I get mad, I don't know what to do with my anger. And, you know, one of the things that he had against him is his dad is in jail. So he might come in, and the teacher won't know this, but he might come into school, have an attitude. He giving you attitude. You don't know why. It's because he don't know how to tell you that the jail may be on lockdown and he ain't talked to his dad in three days. That's right. Yeah. That's a fact. That's right. I, I just think with that, we also got to we gotta expose our kids more. We got to expose them to more. And it's the fact that even if you didn't come from it, it still shouldn't stop you to introduce something different to your children. And a lot of times in the black community, we, we have these sayings that black people don't do that. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Like when you talk about going camping or going fishing or, <laughs> or stuff like that, you know, black people don't do that. That's right. But that shouldn't negate the fact that we didn't do it, that our kids shouldn't be able to go out and enjoy nature because nature is not a white thing. Right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And, um, like, when we look at certain stuff, like I was watching this uh, new show called um, Black Cake on Hulu, and basically she was talking to her son about surfing, and she was like, you know, everybody always looked at surfing as being a white thing, but, you know, in the Caribbean, like, we surf too. You know what I'm saying? It's just like certain things that black people don't do on a normal basis that you kind of get laughed at if you do it, you know, and it's not technically a black thing. You know what I'm saying? At one time, if you was in the marching band, you know, it was considered a white thing. But now you see HBCUs that go crazy mm -hmm. with the marching bands because now you've had kids pick up certain instruments. That's you know right. what I'm saying? It's just certain things like uh, uh, black people don't swim. No, it ain't that black people don't swim. It's that in America, we were we were stopped from going to mm -hmm. uh, to public parks to be able to swim. But That's swimming right. is not a white thing. It's just something that white people had the opportunity to do that now we have the opportunity to do that we got to be able to capitalize on. So just because we weren't able to do it doesn't mean that we shouldn't introduce our kids right. to it. That's how you get a Simone Biles. Mm -hmm. Gymnastics wasn't a black thing. You know what I'm saying? That's how you get these certain situations where black people are starting to grow and we're starting to see the first black, first black, first black, first black. Well, how is it still 2023 and we're still seeing the first black? That's right. Yes, some of it is due to the fact that we didn't have the opportunity. But another thing is due to the fact that we don't expose our kids outside of what we consider black culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and, and what you can afford. You know, sometimes we look at uh, you look at basketball and you wonder, why do you have so many black kids who play basketball? Is because it's probably the one sport that you can do by yourself that in most cases are not that's inexpensive, right? right? You can find a public basketball court somewhere, and even you don't have a basketball. It'll be one it, there. It'll be one there somewhere around, or you have a ball, soccer ball, volleyball, whatever it is, put the ball in the hole, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's it's a, it's something you can do that doesn't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with football. You kids in the neighborhood throw the football, you get involved, right? It's it's an inexpensive sport to get into. When you finally get into contact football, recreation, they supply the equipment. Mm -hmm. Only thing you got to buy is a mouthpiece, mm -hmm. right? So it's things like that that we do because it's accessible to us. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about swimming. Most high schools, especially in urban communities, those schools don't have swimming pools. Right. So there's no swim team because there's no swimming pool. You know, across town at the white school, they got a swimming pool, but you can't go there because you're not zoned. See, this is the funny yeah. thing is now it's not about being segregated. It's about being zoned, zoned yeah. which, right? is segregated. which is segregation, <laughs> yeah. you know. So and these are things, as Bake said, that we're just now understanding. We're just now understanding how they use zoning mm -hmm. to keep schools segregated. Yeah. We're just learning that. And then we don't have enough people that's involved in those processes to prevent them from happening. We're, once again, we're just the victims. Mm -hmm. We're the people who are subject to it, but do not have a representation to prevent it from happening because we don't understand all those things. Yeah. So a lot of things that as parents that we don't get involved in 
what we don't understand. We're raising kids that are going to be victimized by it who in turn won't understand it because they won't learn about those things because we're not exposing to them, exposing those things to them. We're just exposing things to them that we know or things that we saw or things that we did. We're not exposing them to anything new. Yeah, a quick history note for the people who don't understand why we why we brought up swimming and swimming pools. Why is that? How is that relevant in um, American society? They built public parks with swimming pools, and but they were all in white neighborhoods. That's right. And then when black neighborhoods asked for swimming pools, they said we don't have enough funding to be able to do water there and water here. But when black people went to the white communities to try to swim, this is when they were beaten. This is when they were draining the swimming pools. This That's is right. when they were throwing uh, poison in the swimming pools mm -hmm. while black people were swimming in it. So they weren't allowed to do that. So when they came with the, um, with the desegregation of the swimming pools, what they did was they shut down all the public parks with swimming pools. How many public parks do you see? Before? We have one in Lynchburg, Miller's Park, but you rarely do you ever see people say, I'm going to the park to swim. All the swimming pools are at what now? The YMCA's. Mm -hmm. So you had these um, organizations where you had to be part of um, the YMCA, YMCA organization to be able to go in there and swim. And nine times out of ten, they didn't allow black people in those organizations. So it was another avenue that black people weren't going to be able to swim from the public parks because now you can't even go to the YMCA. So that created the history of why black people can't swim That's is right. because they didn't have the opportunity to swim. Or you have to be a member at the Y to swim. You got to be a member. <laughs> and then if you are a member, you got to be able to pay the cost right. to right. be able to do that. Would you, you got anything? Uh, yeah, I got one. Um. If I can get the right password in. Um, it is the importance of. It is, but I'm typing yeah, it in wrong. <laughs> you got to change it. That's the double one for hacking. Um, <laughs> uh, black fathers. Black fathers. Um, why are black fathers important to the black community today? Um, and I, I came across this clip of Ryan Clark, and he said that my dad was everything important. He was at everything important, but he wasn't around all the time. Um, and I see so many kids. Dad, you, you got a saying. Uh, you don't see the dads until it's a football game or a basketball game, um, which are the important or some of the important things. Um and I, I see it all the time now through coaching and through going to my kids' games. And it wasn't until maybe a month ago that our little cousin pointed out that, because I'm going to be honest, my, my oldest son's friends, out of that whole friend group, it might, and it might, be, it might be eight of them. Maybe two or three got dads that's in their lives um, actively. So I, I kind of, I don't want to say I play that role of a father figure to the ones that don't have one. But I, I'm just now learning that my house is their escape from home. My house is where they get the things that they don't get at home. Like I'll give you, I'll give you an example. One of the kids stayed over our house and we had little Caesar. And he walked in the house and said, oh, we eating good tonight. And I'm like, dog, that's Little Caesars. Like, that's pizza. But I, me being, you know, who I am, I, I didn't look at it that way. Um, and also for me, um, you know, with the Ryan Clark thing, he goes on to talk about um, how his dad worked two jobs, uh, came to the games with his uniform on because he had to go to work right after because um, he, he, he said he made those sacrifices – um so he and he didn't get to see him every day. Um and he, he has a quote that I that I love and it says, You're the best you may have been individually, but you being the best individually is not what everybody thinks is best for them. And I give you an example of that is my my one of my sons, Keaton, don't live with me. Um so I'm not at the dinner table. I'm, I wasn't there when he would wake up, if he woke up in the middle of the night and maybe was scared or anything like that. But 
I am at the soccer games. I am at the basketball games. I am at the things that he have going on in school. But like the quote said, individually, that might be good for me, but that might not be good for best thing for him. Um, Dad, so I want to ask you what us two, you know, you, you always been in our lives, even when you was in prison, um, even though he didn't want to come to the prison to see you. Uh, but um, how how did that make you feel where – I know it's, I know for you it had to be tough on you to say, you know, only time I get to see them too is when I got them or I got to create this program so I can see them two more times out of the week. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. <clears throat> Seeing you guys while I was in prison was something that I think that you guys needed to see. I think you guys needed to see where I was. I think that that was important to me. It was because I didn't want you guys to have to end up there. One of my other fa favorite sayings is, I did enough time for both of you and, and my nephew Cameron. So you don't never have to go. I did enough time for all of us. I can share those experiences with you so you ain't got to go experience it for yourself. And I meant that. But I thought it was important that you guys see me in that light so you understand the reality of my actions mm -hmm. and where it landed me. But I, I'll, I'll tell you this. The other thing is, regardless of how it made me feel, <clears throat> because for me, as long as you don't have to feel the pain of what adults feel in those situations, my job's done, right? Let the parent take on those feelings so you don't have to worry about those. Um, I trusted you, you, you guys' as mom. I trusted the fact that she married a person who was going to be great for you. So I didn't have to worry about that. What I wanted to make sure is, is that when people talked about me, that you understood that most of the shit they were saying about me was true. <laughs> Bottom line, it's probably going to be true. But I wanted you guys to understand that has nothing to do with my relationship with you. That's, that's who I was as a person, not necessarily who I was as a father or who I was going to be as a person later on, mm -hmm. right? And I wanted you guys to know that. The other thing is communication. So even when I got out, I had no money. You know, I paid child support. I, I tried to spend as much time with you guys as I possibly could, which is what I did. I had more time than I had anything. Mm -hmm. And when I had you, you guys were my priority. Mm -hmm. So if I'm spending time with you, you, you guys heard some of my conversations that I have with people on the phone. When, <laughs> when, when I'm with you, I'm with you. I don't care about no girls. I don't care about no job. I don't care about no money. I don't care about none, any of that. When I used to take you guys school shopping, it was like you guys could see my wallet. It was like, that nigga got $40. <laughs> Let's go get something to eat, you know. But and it was okay because all I really had was time. And then the one big thing, knowledge. Mm -hmm. I talked to you guys all the time. Probably to the point was like, you guys probably think, Dad, I'm have to shut up. No. Dad going to always talk. That's all I got. I got time and information, and I'm going to give it all to you, every last bit of it, even the ones that some parents want to shield kids from. Well, I didn't have that opportunity to shield you guys from certain things. I tried to be as honest and open with you as possible and let you know what the consequences were going to get you. And then when I didn't want you to learn for yourself, I said, here's what you're going to do. When you guys want to go over and see Quentin and, and, and them and go to the ball diamond, what did I tell you? You go a certain route. Don't go this route, right? <laughs> right. Don't let me catch you going this route, you know? So for did you, me- Did you catch somebody going that route? No. <laughs> <laughs> we can move on. We, we don't talk about that one. We don't say no. We didn't. <laughs> but time, knowledge, that's what I wanted to give you guys. And, you know, for me, it didn't matter how gruesome or bad- the knowledge was. I think it was important that you guys knew the truth and that you heard it from me. The, the crazy part about that, I just, I just had this conversation with Bacon T last week about, um, you know, when, when did for you, when did you know it was time? Because I remember you told me, I, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember you told me, and I, I was in school and you sent me a text message, and I'm looking at the phone like, why is Dad telling me? And 
you was like, I'm telling you because it's going to come a time where he's not going to listen to me no more. He's going to be listening to you. That's right. Um, what, what made you say that to me at that age? The, the people that you're around the most, we I just mentioned that what you do the most is what you're going to do best. Also, the people that you're around the most are going to be your biggest influences in your life. Mm-hmm. So this is this is this this applies to every parent in America. If your child goes to school for eight hours a day and they're leaving home at seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. And you don't see them again until six or seven o'clock in the evening. And then you cook dinner for them and they do their homework. That leaves you about three hours a day with your child. Mm-hmm. Who do you think the biggest influence on that child is? It ain't you. Yeah. Right? But I know that you guys live in the same house, you sleep in the same room. You're gonna be the biggest influence on him because he's gonna spend the most time around you. Also, you were a lot more mature for your age than most kids. So I needed you to be the big brother. I needed you to be the father figure when the father wasn't around. That I, I, I knew that was gonna happen. You're gonna be the biggest influence in his life, right? It it People can say, well, that's sad that you would think that. It, it is, right. but it's the truth. And I, I've never been one of those parents to say that, you know, if, if you would have came to me and said, Dad, I want to be the president of the United States, I was like, you may want to pick something else. Okay? <laughs> you, you, you're you not going to be the president of the United States. I'm not one of those parents. Yeah. I was not one of those parents. Just, just going to tell you, you can be whoever you want to be. Can you do whatever you want to do? Yes. Within reason. Mm-hmm. And right now, who I need you to be is his big brother. I need you to be the mature one, the one that I can count on, that's always going to tell me the truth, even when you know somebody's going to get in trouble, which you did. And I needed you to be that person for him. So that do, was important to me. So and I and I know from from experience, and I'm sure a big no too, for the dads out there that you know, I'm I'm at the point now with, like I said, with my soon to be 11 year old, is like I can tell him things on and off the field, but he hears it better. Like like that video Bake sent for the basketball thing. So we watching it, and, like, I pause it before Bake say something, and I'm like, you know, what should you have done here? And he said the same exact thing that Bake said before he even heard it. So I'm like, bro, like, why do you listen to Bake and not listen to me? I say the same thing. Like, why, why do you hear it different? And uh, his response was, I don't know. It, it, it comes a point in every parent's life where kid. I'm not going to say they don't listen to you. It Later on, a lot of the things that you say later on, they will listen to. It, it happens with every, every person. <laughs> a lot of things that my dad said to me when I was a kid, I didn't really listen to. But now I think about it and I go, that motherfucker was right. <laughs> right. You know? And, and now I, I, I do those things now. It happens. Nobody can really tell you why. I mean, I, I listen to, I'm an Ohio State Buckeye fan. fan. I listen to what Marvin Hagler, uh, Marvin uh, uh, Harrison Jr.'s son, what Marvin Harrison J- Sr. says his son says to him when he tries to give him pointers about what he can do as a wide receiver. And he says he always has some feedback to give me saying, well, I'm not you. And he said, no, you're better than me. <laughs> but I can make you even better than that if you listen to me, right? <laughs> So just because you're better than me already doesn't mean that I can't still help you. Yeah. Right. So as a parent, you get to that point where your kids feel like that your advice is old. Mm-hmm. Right. You're old. That, that you know, that's that's not going to happen now. You know, some of that is true. You know, like I can't tell you, you know, that people can listen to your phone calls the way they used to. Because they can't, because now you got cell phones. Yeah. Well, they can listen, but it's different in how that process works now for them to listen to your phone call. So the information is still good. The how-to might be different, right? Basketball is the same sport it was 40 years ago, right? You just got bigger, faster, stronger kids playing it, but the game is still the same. Football the same way. It has not changed. Do they protect the quarterback a lot more now? Yes, but the game is still the same. So as a parent, there's still information that you can haul for your kids 
that your kids are going to consider old school that's not. They're just not going to listen to you right now. But the hope is that later on, they're going to start replaying the information, which is why I talked the entire time when you guys were kids. Even as a coach. You remember when I first started coaching? Coaches didn't say anything on the sideline. Right. I talked the entire <laughs> game. And I used to teach you guys. I, said, I know parents like, this dude will never <laughs> shut up. Now every coach screams and yells yeah. during a, a rec football or basketball <laughs> game, right? You talk so much that eventually they're like, let me go and listen to this dude so he can shut up. <laughs> and then they realize, oh, shit, he's right. I'll give you another story. Basketball. You guys remember Adam? Yeah. Adam and Ryan and uh, what was my man? Kept Chad. Chad. <laughs> I remember telling them over and over again the same things. And then one tournament game, all of a sudden, we were down by, we were down by two, like 40 seconds left. Drew up a play. They ran the play. We scored. We win the game. They was like, we got it now. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> After two seasons, 33 games, you guys finally get it. Because I kept talking about it over and over and over again. And I said, as a parent, that's all you can do. Give them your time. Give them your information and knowledge. And hope at some point they're going to listen to you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to do both. I'm going to figure out which one I want to do. All right, let's just go. Let's just go something more lighting. <laughs> about racism, right? <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed um, as a vegan is whenever I go to a restaurant or just a place where I can actually purchase vegan food, the majority of the people that are in line with me are black. And I came across an article yesterday that talked about how. Um, African Americans is the highest growing ethnicity in um, America that switched into vegan or uh, uh, vegetarian. And 8% of African Americans identify as a vegan um, versus 3% of the rest of the population. It just shows you how we're growing at a higher rate to a healthier lifestyle mm -hmm. than other people. Um, and this is not something that's abnormal. Uh, before the 1970s, African Americans actually had the highest, higher, um, high fiber diet in, in their in their eating, eating the fruits, eating the vegetables. Uh, it wasn't until after the 1970s where they started putting fast food restaurants in all of the black communities um, in the bigger cities that declined this to 1996 when we became the unhealthiest ethnicity in the country, um, and. Now that you're seeing this growing rate of African Americans um, changing their health and their lifestyle, you know, it's resulting to um, lower risk of chronic diseases and disability and premature death. And they're having life changing health benefits of lowering their blood pressure, lower cholesterol, uh, weight loss, more energy, uh, mental clarity, all of these things. And it's just, it's just great to see that. Black people are beginning to look at healthier options because we are we have a lot of information. Even on social media, most of the people I see doing um, recipes and showing the meals that they're cooking are African Americans who are vegans or vegetarian or even just giving out healthier options. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just great to see. And a lot of it came from hip hop. We talk about um, hip hop's influence on certain things. You know, KRS-One began to talk about this stuff. Wu-Tang, most of them are, are vegans. Uh, Jay, Beyonce, Styles P, Jada Kiss, I think LL Cool J. Um, when you start to see, like, the people that you look up to begin to change their health styles, like, we understand that that's big in the black community. Like, things begin to trickle down to other people going to get more information and begin to, to change their, their lifestyle. I just thought that was dope that... Because most people, when you think of, when I thought of vegans and vegetarians, I thought of, you know, white people. And it was like, no, black people are the growing people that are, are vegans and vegetarian. I just thought that was interesting. That's also due to, I mean, like you said, when you first changed your lifestyle is um, to get rid of those traditional curses. I mean, as black men, when we go to the doctor, I mean, they all ask the same question and it's the same answer. Yes, yes, yes. 
uh, history of uh, diabetes, yes. History of blood, I uh, mean, of uh, high blood pressure, yes. History of uh, any heart disease, yet. Like, all of those things yeah. are yes when we go to the doctor because it's been passed down to us. And it's been passed down to us, and we haven't seen anyone figure it out. No, we haven't seen anybody change. I mean, you start to see so many black people dying at 50, mm -hmm. 55. And the people say, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, they lived a good life. No, 50, 55 is relatively young. Right. Like, that's still young compared to other ethnicities and their life expectancy. Like, you think about 50, 55, 60, that's retirement age. That's the time when you're supposed to go live your life and enjoy your life. But now you got to do chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Now you got to go, um, you got to go to the, um, the place to give your blood. Like, it, it, it's bad when African Americans that we love our culture so much that we refuse to look for healthier options for our culture. It's that same thing. Like if you're not exposed to more, you're not willing to change things in black culture. It can be a detriment. You, you know, in the in the in the seventies, eighties, even the early nineties, you didn't have a lot of black families that had health care. Mm -hmm. And the last person to go to the doctor would be the black male. Mm -hmm. um, black males only went to the doctor when something happened something tragic happened where they had no choice but they needed to go to the hospital but prior to that they would not go um e even in in my family even with me my brothers my dad never really went to the doctor until something bad happened and a lot of that was based on health insurance mm -hmm. but even having health insurance is sort of like uh you just it's a sign of weakness mm -hmm. for a black male to go to to to, to the doctor and so it's we always thought. Always been it's always been viewed that way by most black males, um, until you you get confronted with realisms that sound like stroke, heart attack, death, mm -hmm. uh, permanent disability. Those are all the things that are for black males, especially when you talk about uh, physical disabilities. That that become emasculating for black males. Right, is to face that that reality that you may not have be able to provide for the people that you love. Mm -hmm. And so you go to the doctor and you end up taking medications and things of that, that nature. But a lot of it is based on finances at the start. But even you go back to um, the seventies when black people had high fiber diets and they ate a lot of fruit and things of that nature. That was pre, like you said, fast food becoming convenient, mm -hmm. conveniently cheap. Mm -hmm. But also, that was before you got what's called the family pack of uh, chips, mm -hmm. yeah, where sure. before our snacks was apples and oranges and pears. And then it became too expensive, and you had the offset, which was the family pack of chips. Right Now, you can get that a lot cheaper and the kids are going to be full, full, full of eating that until dinner time. So that became the supplement for meals, yeah. which obviously replaced fruit because the price of fruit went up. So ultimately, those things is how we got to where we are today. But a lot of it was based on finances. That and then uh, a lot of people say, where well, if you, I ain't know eating healthy will cost more. I mean, in the United States, it's going to cost more because they don't want you to eat healthy. That's right. They want you to eat bad. Right, you know, and and despite what people may think, because I'm one of these people that that know that the standards for being healthy is based on the average white man, mm -hmm. right? And the furthest persons removed from that equation are going to be black females, right? Who are by far and far the most unhealthy mm -hmm. of any ethnic group um, in America, and now a lot of that is because we're not built the same as white people. So the average black person is going to have some form of, of high blood pressure. Most of it is going to be associated with what they call hypertension, which we, we inherited that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we retain water, which is why we may, and some people are going to hate this phrase, but it's the truth, which is why we made great slaves is because we retain water which means we can work in extreme conditions and be able to tolerate the heat and be able to perform with a little bit of water to keep us going. They tried. People said, well, why didn't they make Indian slaves? Well, they tried. Indians could not 
endure that those conditions to be able to survive. So we were better suited for that environment. Um, and of course, like I said before, we inherited that. That's a part of our 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 makeup yeah, is that we people. retain we retain water. The great the crazy part is something you just said about uh, women being further away because you know the all of these things are based on the average white that, male. That's right. And I mean, you know how many times my wife that went to the doctor and they say I, we don't know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I've experienced, they call me the medical mystery, you know, <laughs> but you know, the, the biggest thing is, is that the B, the, the, the BMX chart, the, the body mass index chart, BMI chart, is that if the, if you take an average black woman, let's just say an athletic, because I, I think that's important. Let's say an athletic black woman and you take her in her prime and look at the, the BMI chart, she's probably going to be overweight, mm -hmm. right? Being voluptuous does not allow you to fall into the category you should as in the BMI, right? So most women, black women, are going to have what you call curves. Right. When you have curves, that excludes you from the BMI. Yeah. I don't care how much you weigh. I don't care how you look. You're probably going to be overweight by the BMI because it's based on the average white male, mm -hmm. right? So skinny with no curves is what they consider you to be healthy. Yet you see every white woman in America trying to get curves, right? right? <laughs> trying to look like <laughs> black women. So they want black Americans to look more like the average white male, but it's okay <laughs> for the white woman to go out and look like, right. yeah, yeah. You, you get the drink. <laughs> yeah, and, and looking at that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, not understanding the black body is why most of the experiments on the body in this country has been done on black women. That's right. Um, experiment on black women. And I think another one of the reasons why, um, and I never looked at it this way, but just thinking about it more and looking more on social media, one of the main reasons why a lot of black people are going vegan or vegetarian or just a healthier option is because I believe our generation looks more at our, takes our beliefs more seriously. And what I mean by that is the Christians of the 90s are not like the Christians today. Like you, you look at like the, the Israelites, like the people who really believe in that stuff that they really are the the, the chosen Jews, people. like the black like the black people, you look at the people who are really deep into their religion, like they quote the Bible excessively. And when the things that the Bible tell them not to do, they take that seriously. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the not eating the pork and not eating the certain things. When you look at the Nation of Islam, people who joined the Nation of Islam under, um, whether it was under um, um, Elijah, Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad or, or now under Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan, like they follow those strict diets. Uh, me being a spirituality person now, understanding uh, nature, understanding not taking the animals as food, but understanding that they are part of the cycle uh, of nature. And begin to understand that the fruits and the plants that's grown by uh, God are the source that we need to be able to grow within ourselves. And I believe people are taking that a lot more seriously. Like now, if I if I feel like I'm getting sick, I don't get medicine. I'll go get a bunch of fruit and vegetables and eat that to boost my immune system. I think people are starting to understand fruits and vegetables more, and they're and they're taking into their actual belief system. And understanding that the over-the-counter medicine, we we see what they're trying to do. The fast food, okay, we see what we're trying to do. This is what we call consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's why right. that's important. And in and, and order to be able to do that, you have to have one other thing, too, called discipline. Yeah. And all those, to do that, you have to be disciplined. Um, it's just like exercising. You have to be disciplined to exercise on a regular basis. You have to be disciplined. And that's one of the things that most religions teach is discipline. Um, did y'all have anything else? No. No. Did y'all have a giving Raiders. their flowers? If not, I'll... Who? The Raiders? <laughs> Speaking of, I'll, we'll, we'll give somebody their flowers in the NFL. Because I... And I'm not just saying this because I'm a fan. I'm saying this because I'm tired of saying it every week. Mike Tomlin deserves his credit. Yep. Absolutely. I don't care how you may feel about the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't care if you are a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. This man has went 16 years in the NFL, 
and has not had a losing record. People talk about him getting fired every week. He needs to be fired. He needs to be fired. We're, we're mediocre. You're not going to find any coach that can replace a man that's not giving you a chance to be the number one pick, the number two pick. He's putting you in a – I've always been taught great coaches put their players in a position to win. That's right. Even when you don't have the best roster. The Pittsburgh have not had the best roster for a lot of years, mm -hmm. and they still find ways to win games. Hell, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cleveland Browns will tell you every year, it's, I don't care what roster they have, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens Tough can win the division. That's right. They can win the, the damn division. It doesn't matter. And it comes from Mike Tomlin, who came from under Tony Dungy, who worked with Herm Edwards and Lovey Smith and all of that black coaches that they produced there in um, Tampa Bay. That's right. That went on to do great things. Mike Tomlin is still doing great things. And we still, even with the team, they're still trying to figure out how the hell we're 5-3 and three right now. We don't, don't none of us know. Because we can't score a damn touchdown <laughs> to save our lives. But we're 5-3. and three, And we really should be 6-2 and two if we showed up some other some other games. To put your team in position to win and then the, then the fan base call for you to be fired when you haven't had a loser record. And we right. see that they came with affirmative action in the NFL just to give black coaches an opportunity to have a job. And yet you got one that's been there 16 years and haven't let you down yet. And coaches got, his ass off. Got two Super Bowls. Uh, other than Bill Belichick, he's he's the longest tenure Probably, NFL yeah. coach right yeah, now. Yeah, he would have to be. Yeah. Two Super at, Bowls. At least with the same team anyway. Yeah, yeah. Two Super Bowls, three Super Bowl appearances. Come on, man. Stop playing. Give that yeah. man his flowers. I got one for the should have shut up list. Who is that? Dwight Howard. You can close <laughs> the <laughs> window. <laughs> Appreciate you. Love you, Pete. <laughs>